question that I'm going to try to, to answer to is this thing called linear neural systems. Can we represent numbers in the linear lambda calculus? Um, so I'm going to assume some knowledge of the lambda calculus and uh, one of the main things that people know about the lambda calculus when you start understanding that um, is that you can use that to represent all computable functions and one of the first things you need to do is to represent numbers and then after that you need functions to represent arithmetic and so on and then you start <coughs> But the question that I wanted was that um, can we actually do something for the linear lambda calculus? And there's a number of reasons why that was of interest uh, to me. Uh, one of the things is that I was interested in really constant time uh, operations. So, um, and if you look at, so when Church uh, introduced the lambda calculus, he introduced uh, a numeral system, known uh, as Church numerals uh, today. Uh, but there's a few issues with that with, with respect to uh, the efficiency of the operations. So some of the operations, like adding numbers, um, uh, um, taking the successor, and in particular the predecessor of a number, are, ex are exceptionally expensive operations. Um, and because that was the case, uh, that sort of uh, launched this, uh, this uh, attack, if you like, on that problem, to try to come up with something a little bit more interesting. So what I wanted to do is, can we find in the lambda calculus, but specifically the linear lambda calculus, um, operations such as successor, predecessor, test for zero, addition and subtraction, so, in particular, subtraction doesn't seem to be talked about in terms of the lambda calculus, uh, usually, because it's so difficult, because the predecessor usually turns out to be so difficult. Uh, but we really want constant time operations. So that was the first motivation, can we do that? Uh, and it turns out, in fact, that if you look just at the lambda calculus quite generally, uh, that you can do the successor as a constant time operation um, without too much difficulty. The predecessor, it depends on the representation. There are some representations that let you do that as a constant time. Um, the test for zero, uh, this requires some kind of erasing. A test for zero is going to take a number, it's going to be a function which takes a number and returns a boolean. Well, the number has to be erased in some way. It has to be consumed, it has to be uh, discarded. So there's some cost uh, in that. So that's never going to be constant time because it depends on the size of the number. Um, addition, we can get that constant time if we get the representation right. Um, and subtraction, like the test for zero, we get rid of something. And if you get rid of something, it depends on how big the thing is you're going to get rid of. So it's never going to be constant time. So even though my goal is to get constant time operations for all of these, I, I know up front that I'm going to fail in a couple of the cases, but let's try to do it for, for the rest. It's certainly not the case that church numerals uh, has any of these, uh, these uh, uh, points. Um, but the second interest really was to focus on this question of subtraction. Why is it the case that in things like uh, church numerals, um, you have things like addition, uh, multiplication, exponentiation, all the functions that you like, but subtraction doesn't seem to be mentioned. And the reason why subtraction isn't mentioned is because it's exceptionally difficult uh, to do. The predecessor uh, in particular, which in fact in, for church numerals, the first version of that was actually due to, to Cleaney, who, who came up with a, this idea of iterating over the number uh, with, uh, with pairs. And the idea is that depending on the size of the number, you iterate keeping the, the last number and the current number, and when you get to the end, then you project the second component of the pair, which is the one less than the last one. So if you're familiar with that, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. But the point is, is that to take one away from a, a, a million, you have to do a million uh, um, reductions, uh, which seems a little bit uh, expensive. So if you want to take 10 away, so do subtraction, you want to do the predecessor 10 times, so now you're talking about something which doesn't make sense at all. Uh, so the point is, is that can we do uh, something which, let, let's say, so we know we can't do the constant time operation, can we find a way that does that with, let's say, minimal uh, extra work? Um, so the point is, we don't want to do something very expensive. And the reason why I focused on the linear lambda calculus is that in the linear lambda calculus, we have a nice uh, feature for that, which is that the beach reduction step, so the main computation step in the lambda calculus, in the linear lambda calculus, it's an, it's an atomic, it's a constant time I say atomic, it's, it's not atomic, uh, it, it almost is atomic, but it's a constant time operation. And it's not a constant time operation in the usual lambda calculus, simply because of the cost of substitution. But what we'll see in fact, that in the linear case, um, we don't have any substitution to do, um, we can do that uh, straight off. So what I'm going to talk about um, is say a little bit about graph rewriting in the lambda calculus. And the reason why I'm going to do some graph rewriting is just so that maybe you can see if you can remember anything from 20 years ago. Uh, uh, because you'll see something similar to, to that. Uh, but actually, I found this system not in the lambda calculus, but by drawing pictures of lambda terms. Um, so I'll, I'll show you a little bit of the representation for that. I'll then say a bit about the linear lambda calculus, the numeral systems, and then uh, we can get on to the, the real part of the talk, which is sort of the, the second part. 
Um, and I should also say a couple of things before uh, I get into it as well. Um, and that is that that is the case that uh, most people who are interested in looking at numeral systems in the lambda calculus, they're trying to prove that the lambda calculus um, is computationally com complete. So you're in, we're interested in the computability side of things. Well, one of the first things to say is that in the linear lambda calculus, this is never going to you're never going to get there. Um, in other words, I'm going to represent numbers really as a data structure in the linear lambda calculus, but I'm not interested in using the linear lambda calculus to do all the remaining computations. So in other words, I know I have to leave the linear lambda calculus if I want to do computations um, uh, beyond that. I can't get any comput computability results um, in the linear framework. Um, so really then, it's the second point that's important. I'm looking at the linear lambda calculus as a data structure to represent numbers. Um, so we just have to make sure that we understand that. Uh, and all the functions that I want to work on the numbers that I mentioned before, they will also be linear functions, so written in the linear lambda calculus, but we'll need to leave that. Um, and I think it's fair to say um, that if the linear lambda calculus was popular many years ago, and, and by no means do I mean that it's popular today either, uh, but what I mean by that is that I think if, if people had, have, would have thought about the linear lambda calculus when they looked at numeral systems, they might have come up with this. So I think it's just a fact that it wasn't uh, something that, that was on somebody's minds as people were working these things out, then it was kind of left. Um, and in particular, in the early days, the lambda right calculus was what was studied the most, which is um, the lambda calculus where you can't erase, you can't get rid of things. Um, so already, uh, that was one of the considerations that uh, people were looking at. So it's a lot of numeral systems that live in that world. Um, but there's little bits of what I've got to say that have been done before in the 1970s, um, and some of these are um, so I managed to bring some of these back out, but I'm using them in a particular way, um, but focusing on the linear, uh, linear lambda calculus. So now I've mentioned this linear lambda calculus far too many times, I need to tell you what it is. Um, so I'm assuming you know what the lambda calculus is, uh, so basically I've just got a constraint. On so Ian, I think maybe not everybody knows what Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to struggle to give a, a full talk on, on that, but, the, but all the syntax that I need is, uh, is here, and hopefully the pictures will make a bit of sense. So, um, the, the lambda calculus is given by uh, uh, these three uh, cases here. We've got variables, abstractions, and applications. Uh, and basically what we have uh, here is something which, uh, in the full lambda calculus case, is something which is Turing complete with the representable computable functions that I've mentioned uh, before. Um, but it's a functional calculus. And we can think of it really as the foundation of uh, functional programming. So, uh, Haskell, uh, standard ML, uh, CAMEL, uh, Clean, uh, clean, list, and so on. All those languages have a foundation that we can understand is coming from the lambda calculus. And what I'm going to do is to try to understand this language of the lambda calculus, but, but constrain it. So I've got variables, which is the same as the, the usual lambda calculus. Um, for my abstraction, I'm going to put an additional constraint on that when I do an abstraction, so lambda x dot t, and lambda x dot t is just a notation that says I'm going to abstract the variable x from the body of the lambda term t. Uh, so there I'm defining a function, so you can think in Java terms if you want. I'm defining a function, and then I've got, and inside the body of the function, I've got, I'm using a variable x, and that x is a parameter of that function. So it's a method with a parameter x, and I'm using that t in the body. So that's what I'm doing here. So that's the notation of the lambda calculus. But what I'm expecting here is that x occurs in the three variables of t. In other words, each time that I write a function in this linear lambda calculus, I actually have to use x in the body of my function. I can't just ignore it. And the other case of application, so when I apply a function to an argument, uh, which is written just by writing the two things next to each other, um, I have a constraint on that, which says that the, uh, that the function and the argument uh, must have disjoint free variables. So I can't have common variables in the function. So in other words, I can't copy. So what I get, actually, out of the constraints of these two things is that all variables occur at least once, by that rule, and all variable variables occur most once in, and that gives me the linearity constraint. So, uh, those three rules here give me a little calculus, that's the linear lambda calculus, um, and it's a lambda calculus where all, all variables occur exactly once. Should be you, Boston, please. That's the third rule. Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry, where are we? Third rule, right, Boston. So, that on the top, it should be a U rather than a T on the right. Up or down? The rule, the rule, the rule here. Delta tensile in column. So there's no U on the top. Yeah, no. 
the first team. Ah, sorry, yes, you're, you are exactly right. Yes, there's a typo there. That should that be should you. you. Yes, yes, that should be you. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so the alternative way of writing this, cap, this helper, so this is a syntactical constraint. Okay, so I can write my, my lambda terms by having this syntactical constraint here to take. Uh, uh, to make sure everything occurs once. But I can do it another way, I can use a type system. And this type system here, so the three rules, one corresponding to the variable, one the abstraction, the other one the application, changing that to a, a U. Um, these rules, in fact, capture uh, exactly the, uh, the, 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 the syntactical constraints. And that's quite unusual, in fact, because what it's telling us is that every single term that I can write down here is typable. So typability, usually in the lambda calculus and in programs in general, Adding a type system usually says I'm going to restrict the number of programs that I can write. But here, the syntactical constraint is already enough to say uh, that that is exactly the same as what I get from the, from the typing rules. So I don't, get, I don't lose anything by adding types to this. In other words, every term I can write here is typable, and every term that I've got here is syntactically linear here. Okay? So I can do it either way uh, from that. Uh, of course, with the correct uh, Okay, so that's the linear lambda calculus, but I'm going to draw pictures, and I think pictures are, are nicer, especially in the linear case, because we can get some nice uh, representations of, uh, of these lambda terms. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a, a translation of those uh, terms um, with this function here, g, to build a graph of a term t, and I'm going to get a graph that looks like that. And the idea is that I've got one edge sticking out the top, which is the root, so I've got something to hold on to. And all of the free variables of the term, so all of the variables which haven't yet been banged by something, are going to be at the bottom. Okay, so that's my general structure. So I just have to give three cases of this, uh, of this function g, so that I can explain what's happening um, in the different cases. So the first one is a, a variable. I translate a variable just as an edge. So that fits, if I go back uh, to this one here, so if it's a variable, that, that basically says the root is connected to the only one free variable that I've got here. So that's just going to be an edge. If it's an abstraction, lambda x dot u, what do I do? I translate the body of the function, which gives me the structure that I've got, inductively will give me the structure that I've got, and I'm, without loss of generality, I'm saying that the variable x, which will occur exactly once in this, because it's linear, um, is the one on the left. Of course, in practice, it can be anywhere in here. But let's just say it's the one on the left. I bring that round and put a node at the top, and this is this lambda node uh, here. Uh, that I connect to the root. So in other words, I've got a representation which has a lambda node and then the body, and I'm making really a kind of a pointer to where the free variable is in the, in the term. And application, uh, so how do I uh, translate the application of u applied to v? I translate the term u, I translate the term v, I stick an application node on the top, and all of these variables are disjoint. So there's no risk that any variable here will occur twice. Uh, all of those variables are disjoint, so I have no, again, no worries with respect to that. And that's it. That finishes the translation. There's nothing to add uh, to that. Uh, and that basically gives me the advantage now that I can write uh, these, uh, these graphical representations rather than uh, the linear uh, syntax uh, for these terms, uh, which means that I can start drawing uh, pictures that look like this. So here are two examples. So that's the, the graph that I'm translating, the term I'm translating here. Lambda x dot x applied to lambda x dot x. So the identity function applied to the identity function. That looks like this. So that's the identity function here, lambda x. The body was the variable, and that's banned back up here. And I've got another one of those, and I'm applying it, I'm applying two of those. This is the lambda term, lambda x, lambda y, y applied to x. So see, that's y and x. And the thing you should notice is that in the pictures, we don't even bother with, with variable names. And the linearity constraint is used, in fact, because every, every edge here has got one place to go. So I'm never going to have an edge that suddenly needs to go to two different places and that's guaranteed by the linearity constraints. So now I've got pictures that look like this for my, uh, for my lambda terms. What about reduction? Well, beta reduction, which is applying a function to the, uh, to the argument, lambda x dot t applied to u is the reduction, uh, is the red x, where I need to show what happens uh, and how that will reduce. What do we do when we apply a function to an argument? We take the body of the function and we replace all of the free variables uh, which are corresponding to the parameter, so that's x. So all of the free variables of t will get replaced by u. So I want this thing uh, over here. So if I draw a picture of what I've got on the left-hand side, uh, that's what I've got to start off with. So that's the, the red x uh, here, the thing that I want to reduce. And what I've got on the right-hand side is the term t, where I want to say that I've got the, the, the free variable x gets the, the term u put into it. So somehow I would like this thing to represent the result of doing the substitution. 
But the interesting thing is, is they've actually got nothing to do for that because the substitution isn't held up in any way. There's, not, there's no boundary for this thing here inside here to go to the actual place where that variable is needed. So in fact, substitution has happened for free. So this is the representation of t u for x. Okay? So the substitution operation has zero cost in this, uh, in this calculus. But of course, I still have the Peter reduction step to do, to go from this to this. But if you look at this carefully, what you'll notice is that the result here is the term t, the graph corresponding to t, which is this one. So what I want to do is to connect the root here to the term t. So I kind of want to connect that edge together here. right? And the term t has the free variable x here when I take the lambda away, and I want to connect that here. So I can kind of connect that edge here to that edge here. And if you kind of sort of follow those uh, my, my points are moving in random ways on the board there. I want to connect the top thing down to here and connect this thing here over onto the right-hand side. And I can express that by taking away all the rubbish and just looking at those two nodes together uh, as what we might call a local uh, rewrite rule. Uh, so that's connecting the root to, to this thing here. And it connects the, the variable here to the argument. So basically that's my beta reduction. And when I said before in the linear case what we get is a, a some kind of an atomic step, this is what I meant by that, because that's something which is constant time. I know exactly how much it costs to implement that, for instance. It's however long it takes me in my representation to, uh, to garbage collect those two nodes of the graph and uh, do the appropriate, appropriate real, uh, real uh, wiring uh, of my data structure. And once I've done that, that's the beta reduction, and as I said before, the substitution happens for free. So the cost of a reduction now is exactly how many beta reductions you've got. Yes? Question here. So, uh, in the, in the non-linear case, we could still imagine such a representation. Oh, indeed, you can. Yes, yes. And then, wouldn't you have constant time? Well, time depending on the number of free variables. Well, what you've got now is the cost of substitution becomes important. So it's not the case. So here, I said the substitution is for free, and the reason why substitution is for free is that there's nothing stopping me from putting that in. If I had uh, the non-linear case, I might have to copy substitutions. Right. And when number I propagate, equal to the number of free variables. Right. Because when I propagate that in, I might have to erase it or copy it and do various things, and that has a real cost. And that's really the, the expensive part of the, the non-linear case. But in the linear case, there's nothing stopping it. There are no barriers to that substitution process. So it's exactly the point that I'm not explaining here of the non-linear case, how that substitution gets pushed into the term. And by getting that in, I have to potentially do the duplication. So there's actually one occurrence of x and t. There's exactly one occurrence of x, and it's, there's nothing on the edge. The edge of where I want it and the edge where it comes down, there's nothing. There's no other nodes in the way, so there's nothing to push it through. There's no scope limitations, nothing. So all, all notions of scope uh, are captured in these, uh, in these examples. So let me just uh, let me find you a couple of examples here. So this is an, uh, an example term here. So that's lambda x, lambda y, y applying to x. So here, all the, all the notions of scope are dealt with in this representation. So what does that mean? It means that this thing here, the scope of the, the, the lambda y here, uh, is going to be where? Well, the thing is, is that it's, it's, it captures this thing here. But once I've applied the thing uh, above, so that was a lambda x, that's got, got a direct connection here. And there's nothing to stop me from doing that. There's no notion of variable capture that's going to get in the way of doing that. But if I had several variables here, then I've got an issue uh, for um, uh, precisely for scope issues, because I can potentially get variable capture and so on. So I get no, none of those issues whatsoever that come out of this representation. So just going back then to, to this, so the point is, is that that's my reduction. It's uh, an, uh, a local reduction step in the graphs, and uh, I know the cost of doing that, and there's nothing else uh, involved. Okay, so let's look at an example reduction. So this is uh, an example I showed before. Lambda x not x applies to lambda x not x. If I do one step of reduction, that connects the root to the body here, and this one to this, and then if I just straighten out that long wire, which is basically saying this edge that comes down here, if I just straighten that out at the top, I get lambda x dot x, the representation of that. Okay? So I get that using one uh, reduction step. So identity divided to identity reduces to identity in the one step. This is another example. So this is lambda x, lambda y, y applied to x. All of that applied to the identity function, and all of that applied to the identity function. And now if I, I see the red x here, that's where I've got the lambda and the application. When I do the thing here, what's going to happen is, is that the argument is going to get plugged in here. So I've drawn it uh, in its correct position. But basically that thing there was connected up to, to the argument. Okay? So we copy that over here, and that now gets connected up here. We've now created a new red x, which is in the old one, that node with that node here. Those are found here. So we've got a new red X. 
Again, I can apply that, which will put this identity function um, over here. And what that is, is it will give you then the identity applied to the identity, which is the previous example that I gave you before. So in fact, this one, I can do two reductions to get it to n, and then it's this graph. Uh, so I can do one further reduction to get that. So it's three, three reductions will get you that down to the identity function. Okay? And there's no extra work, as I said, that needs to be done. Um, and that's just another example, just so you can see what things can look like. This is the uh, similar lambda term, but the, other, the variables are going around. That's lambda x, lambda y, x applied to y. Okay, so we can see that we can, if we swap over those two things, we've got x, y, or y, x, which was the previous example. Okay, so that's what these things look like. So I've now got some graphs representing uh, lambda terms, uh, and I'll use those later on when I want to explain what's going on uh, in a couple of things. Okay, so those graphs, you can sort of put those on a shelf for a minute, uh, and we'll come back to those when, uh, when it's appropriate so I can show you what's, uh, what's happening. So now I want to go back to uh, representing numbers uh, in, the, in the lambda calculus. And to begin with, that's the, the standard definition of a numeral system. So what is a numeral system in the lambda calculus? It's uh, a sequence of lambda terms, uh, d0, d1, and so on, such that each, each of those is a closed lambda term. And if I can beta reduce, it doesn't really matter to the details of this, in fact, but the point is, is that what I want is that the normal forms of those uh, representations uh, are going to correspond to the appropriate numbers. So if I've got two, beta ter two terms that are beta equal, they correspond to the same uh, number. So in other words, what I'm looking for are lambda terms representing numbers, and if I've got two different lambda terms uh, and they produce the different normal forms, then they're going to give me different numbers. That's the thing that I'm interested in. And what I'm adding to that is that I'm going to call that a linear numeral system where each of these numbers is a closed, not only is it a closed term, but it's a closed linear term. So it's, it's in a linear lambda calculus. And the standard things that we need uh, in the definition of a numeral system is we need a successor, a predecessor, and a test for zero. Because once you've got those three things, you can define everything else using uh, fixed points and, uh, and so on. Um, of course, once I start defining those things using fixed points, those can be very expensive. In particular, if I define addition using successor and fixed points, that can be a, quite an expensive way uh, of doing uh, addition, and we'll come back to that later. But the point is, this is the minimum requirements that we need, a successor, a predecessor, and a test for zero. So what I'm looking for uh, is a lambda term, a closed lambda term S, such that S applied to a number gives me the next one. Okay? So uh, S applied to the number corresponding, the lambda term corresponding to N, needs to give me the lambda term corresponding to n plus 1. The predecessor will take me down 1. And assuming I've got some representation of true and false in the lambda calculus, uh, 0 applied to the number, the term corresponding to 0 should give me true. And 0 applied to the, a non-zero uh, term should give me false. So I want all of these functions, s, p, and z, to be closed terms. Um, and that's the definition of a numeral system. And there are many of these. Yes. You use equality for beta equality. Beta but that, that's, in, that, that's in the def This is just the standard definition of a numeral system, and it's just saying, saying there that if I've got two lambda terms that are beta equal, then they should correspond to the no, same. I mean over there in the, the requirements for a numeral system. This one here. Yeah. The next. Oh, here. Is Sorry. Yes. Or, uh, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not saying that this could be. Uh, it doesn't really matter what that is. Uh, for the moment, but yes, it's beta. It's beta equal. It's equal beta. It should. I should okay. put the beta there, um, but I'm, I'm reducing uh, uh, to those things. Yes. So um, there are a number of terms that, uh, sorry, a number of numeral systems uh, that have been uh, defined that satisfy these things, but are not. But none of those uh, are linear. And some of them. Are, well, the most well-known one is the one due to Church. Uh, less well-known one due to Scott. Uh, but also Wadsworth has one, and Bohm, uh, who also has some similar ones. To, to Warsaw as well, and many more. And I say many more because there are many, many more uh, of these uh, systems, uh, but none of them, as I say, uh, are, are linear. Uh, so to begin with, let me show you one that's not linear. Uh, so this is church numerals, which is the most well-known one, and I want to use this sort of as a starting point so that I can see uh, a few things and explain to you why, why I want to look at this problem uh, again uh, and do things in a different way. So this is the sequence of church numerals, and these are the lambda terms that correspond to 0, 1, and 2. And the way that they're representing, we're representing those are by repeated uh, application. So the idea is that the church numeral corresponding to 3, so let's take this, sorry, to 2, which is this thing here. What is it? It's a function that takes, actually takes the argument and the function and applies the function twice to the argument. So that's the way that we think about it, and it's, it's an iterator that we're, that we're defining. So if you're defining 10, you're going to say, I want to apply this function 10 times uh, to the argument. 
And uh, depending on where you read that, you'll typically find the X and the F the other way around. Uh, there's no big deal uh, in that. Uh, it's just convenient to put them this way so that the representation of one doesn't eat a collapse, but that's not, it's not important uh, for us here. But the point is, is that that is a representation. It's a very nice representation. It works. It does a lot of things, and there's lots of good advantages uh, for this. And we can define the standard functions over that. And I'm not, again, I'm not in the linear lambda calculus at the moment. So, for example, the successor function is this term here. Um, I don't want to go into the details of what it is, but I just want to point out that it's not linear. So here I've got uh, a function of three parameters, and the third parameter is f. That's used twice, so that's not a linear term. So to add one is not going to be, uh, to be linear. And the idea is that successor applied to any of these numbers will give you the next one. Okay? That's the definition of what those things are. Uh, the predecessor is quite a nasty piece of work. Um, and that's one of the nicest ways of writing it down. That doesn't require that I write um, predecessor using uh, a fixed point and defining pairs uh, and so on. This is a way that you can define that directly. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if you actually pick this uh, apart a little bit and see that what, in the, what is a number represented as, it's repeated application of the second argument to the first. What we see is that when we apply this to a number, the number will come in here. This first lambda term here will be the, the x, the argument here, and this lambda term here will be the f. So that's going to be applied, that function there will be applied n times uh, to this thing uh, here, and the result will be applied to the identity. And this gives us a predecessor. But it's a very expensive operation. In other words, if I want to, if I want to do the predecessor over 100, I've got 100 copies of this thing to make, okay? which is certainly not something we can claim as a constant time operation. So what's the last symbol there on that line? This one, it's i. It's the lambda uh, identity, I, identity yeah. function, yes. Lambda x dot x is the identity yeah. function, yes, thank you. Um, and here I've got uh, then a test for zero. And this is a term here where t and f are lambda terms corresponding to true and false. Um, I don't want to worry too much about those. Um, but I can also write addition in this framework. So addition comes out uh, with this term. And this is something which was quite surprising to me, because if you look at that term, it's a function that takes four parameters and it uses each of those parameters exactly once. So addition actually is a lambda term in the church numerals, which is a linear term. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and I can define subtraction in this one by doing, um, by iterating the predecessor, which I've already told you is a really nasty piece of work. I can iterate it uh, a number of times. In other words, if I want to take three away from a thousand, I can take one away from a thousand, and then I can take one away from that. And each time I do that, uh, I'm doing 1,999, uh, iterations uh, to get this, okay? So it's a very expensive operation, this subtraction. So that's one way of writing it down. There are some alternatives to those. Uh, for instance, the successor I can write it in a, as another lambda term, a different one. Uh, it's still non-linear, but I can do it, a, do it a different way. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, I can do addition that looks in a similar way to, to subtraction, which is going to do um, basically iterating the successor function. So now I've got addition, which is a non-linear version uh, of addition, uh, a very expensive one, but you might like the look of it, because it's, uh, uh, you, might, you might intuitively understand that you are repeatedly finding the successor of one number. Um, by iterating the successor, you're getting the, uh, the addition uh, of those, uh, those numbers in the way that you might want it. Um, but it's very expensive to do that. And if I want to do predecessor, uh, well, there are other ones, and this one repairs, for example, is one that I mentioned, but then I need a fixed point, and I don't want to go into the trouble of defining fixed point operators, pairs, and everything uh, to define that. But the standard one, the one that Church gave, which is due to cleaning, uses uh, these, these pairs. So I won't even bother writing that down because it's just way too expensive uh, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so if we look at this representation, the nice thing about it is that it's got iteration built in. Uh, and depending on the way that we define add, which, which choice we make, it can be efficient. It can be this linear function uh, here, but it can also be, be very inefficient. But the predecessor, and therefore subtraction, uh, are very expensive. Okay, um, okay so let's move to uh, the second one. So this is stock numerals, so an alternative numeral system, which is this one uh, here. Um, and I don't want to go into uh, to too much details about this one. We'll see similar things uh, later on. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that the successor function uh, that I write down uh, is, uh, um, is not going to do any, uh, any copying, that's nice. Uh, and the predecessor is a constant time predecessor. So it's a representation of numerals that I've got here, where I've got uh, 
basically a linear, almost linear um, successor and an almost linear predecessor. But these terms are not linear. Okay, so the representation is zero, uh, lambda x, y, x, uh, the y doesn't occur in the model. So here we've got something which already is not so bad. Um, but the interesting thing is that, that we've got a, a, a very nice predecessor. However, on a negative side, I should say that the test for zero is, is very simple to do uh, as well. But on a very negative side, add and subtraction, and in particular add, which was a linear function, a constant time function in the church numerals, uh, I haven't even bothered writing that down. Why? Because I already need some power of recursion. So I need to define a fixed point uh, operation, and I need to then start writing add as uh, repeated uh, success. So I want to basically say if the first number is zero, then the answer is a second one, otherwise it's the successor of the predecessor, and so on. So I need to define uh, that using the, uh, the usual algebraic data type of, of, uh, of numbers. So it becomes uh, a very expensive operation, these things. I, like, I don't even bother writing. But we did have something interesting there, that we have some, uh, uh, some linear, almost linear functions, some very uh, cheap functions, if you like, uh, to do those operations. Um, let me just mention briefly uh, Wadsworth uh, systems, which uh, Bohm also uh, uh, has some of these systems. Uh, and that's where you take uh, a very different approach, uh, and that's where you take your numeral systems, where you uh, take uh, each number is going to be uh, a, a, um, basically adding on another lambda at the beginning. Uh, one of the problems of doing this, of course, is that you, you change uh, considerably the structure of your, your term, uh, which makes it very different, very difficult uh, to do a number of operations afterwards. And the, although you can do it, I won't go into it in, in, in any detail, so basically the number n is represented by lambda, and then you need uh, n plus two variables, and then a permutation of those n plus uh, two variables uh, afterwards. The problems that you have is that some of the functions that you need, uh, for example, the test for zero, uh, you need to several copies of the, uh, of the number. Um, and on the other hand, uh, one of the things that you have is that your normal forms are not normal forms that you want. Uh, you have to apply, uh, you have to get, uh, sorry, you have to have in the system uh, eta reduction as one of your reduction rules because you require eta collapse uh, to get it down to, to the normal form uh, of your number. So it's a kind of an awkward situation in terms of the way that we're thinking of these in terms of the graphs, for instance, because the graphs are representing the, the numbers the volume, the terms, I've got to add an additional rewrite rule, which I, I don't want to put in, uh, which I would need if I was going to do that. But nevertheless, it has a relatively efficient add and predecessor, so we've got now predecessor and add, uh, so that's different from, from the other ones, um, but it's got some non, um, some, some non linear parts that are quite expensive, the test for zero, for instance, and you, and you need this uh, eta collapse. So it's quite, there's some nasty things there uh, as well. So why did I show you those three systems? Um, I showed you those three systems because those are the three main uh, directions in which you can put, sort of make a serious attempt at representing numbers uh, today uh, in the Lambda calculus. And the interesting thing is that each system has something good. There's something good in each one. So I said that's got a nice, uh, the addition is a constant time operation. Another one I said, well, that's got a nice predecessor and so on. Um, so th there's some good stuff around, but not, no one system has all of the, uh, all of the good things. And, None of them are linear. Okay, so that's a side point. That's my my issue. But uh, uh, none of those systems have all of the good things. So what we want to do then is the following: we want to get the best features of each, and I also want them to be linear. And I'm going to get that really the inspiration from those systems really by using those diagrams and thinking about how to plug those things uh, together. So if we have a look at, uh, at the successor of the in the church numerals. So this was a representation of the church rule, so it's repeated uh, application of the second argument. So f applied to f applied to f, sorry, uh, it's three, three f's applied to x, uh, that was the number corresponding to three. If we look at our graphs, but this is, the, this is of course a non-linear term, so let me just use our graph notation with just the bit that I'm interested in. So there's more here that I can't actually represent because it's not a linear term. But the main thing is I've got some applications that go down here corresponding to uh, f applied to f applied to f applied to x. Okay, so that's the, the graph here. And when I do a successor, well, what does the successor do? So that's the corresponding to the number n, which is three. When I do a successor, what do I do? I actually put uh, this extra f at the end. 